and welcome to this episode of the Good Citizen Podcast. It's my honor to be here today on the campus of Purposeful Design with David Palmer. Dave, David, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thank you very much. And so I had a chance to be here a few weeks ago. We actually, <laughs> time goes so quickly, um, and, and actually see the amazing ministry that's going on in this space. I was just so blessed by it, and I wanted to share that with the audience. Uh, so David, would you jump in and give us just the, the top line of what is Purposeful Design doing? and kind of a little bit of your background and, and your, your position here. Sure. Thanks, Josh. Purposeful Design was founded about eight years ago to do two things, to create jobs for some men in our city who don't have one and who would have a really hard time getting one because of past experiences, struggles with things like um, addiction, being in prison, felonies, homelessness, broken relationships, poverty. So. Reason number one for our existence at Purposeful Design is to create jobs for men who have struggled through that and are still struggling in it. And secondly, to do what we call on-the-job discipling. We're a faith-based organization, and we work hard to infuse all that we do with uh, the gospel, the word of God, and Jesus Christ. Amen. I've been able to see that firsthand. It's, It's truly remarkable. So... Just a brief overview of your background. I was actually uh, kind of laughing with you last time because, of course, you, you make amazing amazing furniture, and I don't think you had any kind of craftsman background, uh, about as much experience as I do <laughs> with, with the saw. But explain a little bit of your, your background, and then what, how did God move in your heart to launch uh, something like Purposeful Design? Well, it's true. I'm not a craftsman. No one's ever called me Handy Dave. Okay. Okay. Um, but I have a business background and a following Jesus background. And I was on the board of the directors at Wheeler Mission here in Indianapolis for 10 or 15 years. And more importantly, for my own personal experience than being on the board was that I went to Wheeler Mission once or twice a week for that long. I spent time with the men in Bible studies and different kinds of um, exchanges. and. When I would talk to them, I'd naturally often say or ask, how are you doing? And so often the answer that I got back was, I'm looking for a job. I heard that over and over again. And I felt sorry for the men that, when I heard that, hmm. because partly because I had a job that was taking care of me and my family, and I even enjoyed my work and found it challenging. I liked the people I was with. But they didn't have a job, and I knew that there were big barriers between them and a job. Mm. lack of experience, yeah. lack of transportation, lack of credibility, lack of relationship, lack of everything, felony charges. And I wished that I had a job that I could pull out of my pocket and just give to them and mm. say, good, there, man, go. You got a job. But I didn't. And I was in a time in my life when I was um, learning that when I run into something that's way bigger than me, which actually happens quite a bit, mm. that that's a good time for me to just ask God about that that hmm. obstacle or that challenge, that question that I have. So I decided I would just ask the Lord about that. And I prayed a simple prayer, Lord, what do you say about this no job thing? What do you say mm-hmm. about this? And I didn't have any ideas going. I just thought, I just asked God about it. And hmm. then a few others gathered around. We prayed together that same prayer. And that's what that simple prayer led to eventually purposeful design. It, it is always a... A prayer of faith, but perhaps a little scary. <laughs> he's like, God, you know, somebody should do something about that. And he's like, oh, yeah, you. Right. <laughs> uh, right. For those that, that may not be familiar with Wheeler Mission, uh, one of the a key kind of historic ministries in Indianapolis, serving uh, those that are experiencing homelessness, uh, drug addiction, etc. cetera. So right. uh, it's amazing just being keyed in and for board members of organizations, what a great example uh, of just listening. Hey, what are the problems? What are the holes? and then being willing to kind of explore that. So would you fast forward just a little bit? So you had this kind of idea, you're praying about it. What was the next step? How did God lead you to start this? Well, I didn't have a plan. I didn't even think that I had anything to do with what God might want to see done here. But I was doing something on the internet one day, and I bumped into the idea of folks taking old shipping pallets and breaking them down and making what you might call sort of cool, chic urban furniture Mm. out of old shipping pallets. And I I looked at that and I thought, well, that looks, it's kind of cool. And it looks so simple to do. And I thought maybe even a guy, a no talent guy like me could learn to do that. And then I wondered, I wondered if some of the men at at, um, Wheeler Mission could learn to do that. 
And if I wondered if we could sell sell some of that furniture, maybe create a job. I don't have a job I could give them, but mm -hmm. maybe we could create a job. So that was yeah. a, that was the start. And we actually then a, a small team of us, three or four guys, that were praying together. We decided, well, let's just get some shipping pallets, old ones, and let's just try it mm -hmm. and see what happens. And so we did. And then we invited a group of about 20 or 30 friends to my living room 10 mm -hmm. years ago. And we put the idea, we just shared the idea. We said, hey, we're just thinking about this. We don't know if this has any merit at all, the concept or the product. But what do you guys think? And enough people that day said, we like the idea. We like your mission, your purpose. And we like this product enough to put $400 on the table okay. you know, and mm -hmm. to take, take one of these. And that was what we had decided before the meeting. We said, if there's a kind of a positive response, we might take a next step forward. And there was enough of a positive response that night that we said, let's take the next step. Hmm. So before we go further, I often will ask kind of early on in the interview, just a, a favorite story or your favorite, favorite story or experience here at Purposeful Design. Anything recently mm -hmm. that really just spoke to your heart? Well, there is one, uh, one of our craftsmen, that's what we call the men mm -hmm. that we're here to serve. Antoine is his name, and Alicia is his fiance, who he refers to as his old lady. <laughs> and that's not a derogatory sure. thing in his view, that's just, sure. that's what you call that person in his okay. world. Anyway, so they, they have five little kids, and they live in a, in a bad part of town. He works here, and his life is getting a lot better, mm -hmm. um, kind of rapidly if you look at the, the full panorama of where he's come from. But it's still tough for them. Five little kids, he has a, a low full-time job, but relatively for a lot of us, comparatively speaking, a low, low income. He's trying to provide for five little kids wow. and his wife and himself in a rough neighborhood. And his, his fiance's sister in Missouri was pregnant and going through all kinds of difficulties, relationship difficulties, addiction difficulties, bad relationship difficulties. So, and she was pregnant, about to have a child. So what does Antoine do? He thinks the right thing to do is, we're gonna take care of your sister. So he invites her to come live with them in Indianapolis. Wow. She moves in, now he's got more mouths to feed, <laughs> and they have a little house, a little house in a bad area. So he, he takes her underneath their umbrella. Hmm. She moves in, all's going well, she has a baby, which is a good, good happy thing. But three weeks later, the baby died in its oh. crib during the night. Oh, man. So three week old um, deceased baby in the crib in that small house with seven, eight people. And um, so that morning, he, he called me early in the morning, 6 a.m. or so, <clears throat> and I went over and there was a swarm of police there, a swarm of child protective kind of mm. experts there because they wonder, okay, how'd this baby die? Mm -hmm. And they needed to do their investigations. The house is full, a, a, a deceased baby here in the, in the living room full of all these people that are asking hard questions wow. and maybe even assuming the worst. And there wasn't any, anything bad that happened except that the baby died in the night. No, mm. no foul play, no wow. neglect, nothing like that. But they, the women were wailing. You read in the Bible about the people mm. wailing oh. at the funerals. The women oh. were wailing, and it was a house full of misery and pain. And, and they don't have money. One of the things that I fall back on when something bad happens in my life, I have a, I have a pocket full of money. I can, mm. I can buy a way out of this. In, in one way or another, I can buy mm. what I need. I can buy a funeral service. I can buy food. I can buy stuff. And they didn't have any of that. And so a lot of questions. And... Anyway, so they began to process, how do, we, how do we do this? What do you do with a um, deceased baby in the crib? Now what? And they didn't know what to do. They didn't have any experience with that. But just to roll forward a little bit. So two things that um, came out of that was that Antoine, who's, who is a changed man now, he came from a Muslim background. He's a Christ follower now hmm. and learning a new way of living, walking, thinking, talking. And what he and his fiance Alicia have decided to do, now that they've recovered, they have the wind back in them, mm. and they're thinking new thoughts, they said, they looked at themselves and they said, you know what, we've got extra. One night a week, we're gonna put together plates of food from mm. our kitchen, 
our little kitchen, and we're going to walk up and down the neighborhood and give away plates of food to right. our neighbors who don't have all that we have. Wow. Well, what a beautiful story. I mean, just the heartbreak of life and perhaps in the past, the default may have been back into, you know, some something else that you might lean on in times of difficulty. And now they're they're leaning into serving their, their neighbors. Yes. Uh, just one other powerful story is I was able to tour the facility uh, last time I was here. Uh, I was just one of the craftsmen sharing with me that this past Thanksgiving was the first Thanksgiving uh, that he was able to host it in his own home. It was the first time in his life, I, you know, I would have pegged him as uh, perhaps a little bit more middle-aged um, and just so so proud about that. And just, wow, I mean, transforming lives kind of right in front of your eyes right there. And so this is a remarkable ministry. I know those that are listening or, or watching don't have the opportunity to be here, but it's just a, a remarkable place. And about that, that kind of story, yeah. that gentleman probably in the past didn't have a couple things essential to having Thanksgiving in your home. First of all, he didn't have a home. Mm. Secondly, he didn't have relationships. All of his relationships were probably wrecked mm. by addictive behavior. And third, he wouldn't have had money to buy the turkey anyway. That's true. But, yeah, just so many of those important pieces, and that by having purposeful work, um, can can actually provide those for himself. Um, and, and we'll get into this more as we go along, but I'm encouraged by a, a movement and, and Christians that are working to alleviate poverty, um, that are focusing on that dignity aspect. We don't want to just give you something because that just giving you Christmas gifts for your kids may steal the dignity um, that you need to actually transform your own life. Um, and so that's one of the, the great aspects of this. So just kind of broad overview. Your mission is to rebuild lives and fight poverty. Uh, will you give kind of the broad overview ministry strategy of Purposeful Design? Sure, yes. What we do is we hire men and train them to build beautiful handcrafted custom furniture. Men coming out of addiction, homelessness, poverty, broken relationships, long struggles in that. We hire them and train them to make the furniture, and then we sell the furniture to create a revenue stream to fund the jobs. And for the last five years, we've covered at least 90% of our operating expenses through sales of the men, uh, through sales of the things that the men we serve make themselves, which is awesome. And I, um, well, I shared that not too long ago with some of the leaders at um, United Way. Mm -hmm. And when I shared that statistic, they almost fell out of their chairs because they're not customarily um, dealing with organizations that are largely, almost entirely self-funded. So we're really happy with that that we can create revenue to, f to fund the life change that we're hoping to see. And just for a reference point, and I would encourage listeners to actually go to Purposeful, Purposeful Design's website. It will be listed in the show notes. And actually take a look at some of the amazing uh, furniture that, that they're making. Um, and this is being sold to high-level United States corporations, um, others that may have offices around the world. Uh, my, my favorite purposeful design table is actually in the Indianapolis airport. And I was joking with uh, the guys uh, at the discipleship time um, that it's that that's prime real estate in the Indianapolis airport. People are always kind of eyeing each other like, who's, who's going to get the table? They're, they're beautiful wood tables. Um, you can actually charge your phone there as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and so it's a remarkable, beautiful, uh, beautiful product that's then being sold to many large corporations like Eli Lilly and others. Um, and so in, in economics, we often talk about kind of supply and demand. I, I was intrigued by kind of the demand side of this, that there is actually development in corporate America, and that if they're going to purchase a table, they want to purchase one that's going to be actually helping someone. So we've talked a little bit about the supply. I mean, you have, you have workers coming in that I, I was talking to another ministry. I think 1,000 individuals come out of, out of jail in Marion County each month. Um, and if those individuals within a very short period of time don't have transportation, um, a job, and housing, they're probably going to go back in. Um, and so you have these individuals that are coming out, you're helping them. But would you describe some kind of in corporate America how that's developing and how they're, uh, and just if you're comfortable listening some, listing some of the partners that you've developed mm -hmm. in that space? Sure. Well, one of the reasons why our model is, has proven to work so effectively is that we are inviting corporate America to throw their weight into the fight against poverty. And of course they have, corporate America has enormous weight 
and all different kinds of weight that we might not even imagine initially. They have capital, they have purchasing needs, they have expertise, all kinds of weight that they have. So we invite corporate America to throw their weight into the fight against poverty, and we put into practice the simple principle of supply and demand as we think about our model, and that is, for us, we define supply and demand a little bit differently. On the supply side, for us, that's the large, too large supply of formerly homeless, addicted, incarcerated individuals, a large, a large supply, and it's a growing supply, and a supply that we, we actually want to shrink, mm -hmm. not grow. On the demand side is corporate America purchasing product, in this case, from purposeful design. In between, mm -hmm. we picture purposeful design in between that supply and that demand. And purposeful design is their building product and doing the work of trying to rebuild lives. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen is that as the demand grows, and it has for us, it's grown a lot. We had 30 some thousand dollars worth of sales our very first year, which I thought was great because I thought it might be zero. <laughs> so that was good. Um, last year, a little bit under $2 million in sales. So while dem when demand grows for us, what we see is that the supply sh side actually shrinks. Mm -hmm. And it literally, it is shrinking in Indianapolis because we are actually pulling men out of the homeless mission and off the street, and it's sticking. So that's how it's working. It's really simple, and it works because corporate America, two things about corporate America, they actually want to do good in their mm -hmm. city, and they want to see their citizens, the people in their city, do better, live better, live more healthfully, and they need furniture, and that's what we make. <laughs> so it's a great one, two, kind of the easiest sell in the world. Sometimes it seems like the most brilliant I ideas are the simplest, mm -hmm. and it's just like there's a there's a demand, yeah. and then you, you you're identifying a population that needs assistance. And there's something that goes back to Eden about purposeful work, and so you, you, the name of your organization, Purposeful Design. Uh, would you explain that a little bit and how that's a a key um, a key principle that you're focusing on here? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, we believe that God has a purpose for every person, that there is a purpose for living. And for some of us, we may be searching for that purpose. And, and sometimes a sense of hopelessness. I, I don't know what my purpose mm -hmm. is. I feel like I'm purposeless. And certainly the men that we serve, that'd be true for a lot of them. They may feel like I have no purpose mm -hmm. and, and therefore no hope for the future. But we think that that's not actually true, that God has, he's built each of us with a purpose. Mm -hmm. and, and part of the life challenge is finding that purpose. But we, we hope that we help individuals discover God's purpose for their living. There's um, a part of this story where I believe you actually moved kind of from suburban Indianapolis into the Brookside neighborhood. It was part of College Park Church. I also wanted to kind of capture some of that. This was purposeful design. Uh, it's, it's not something that you have just do on 8 to 5 on a day. Um, but this was part of a broader vision for engaging a, a troubled neighborhood in Indianapolis. Will you dig into that a bit? Sure. And to go back to the beginning for me and my wife, my wife actually was led by the Lord to start about 15 years ago, an organization called Heart Change in this part of Indianapolis on the Near East Side, which is a high poverty area. He very clearly led her to that. It was a surprise calling. She didn't feel prepared for it or mm. qualified for it, but she and some friends started this organization called Heart Change, and they serve women and their children who are living in poverty and ex have experienced all kinds of mm -hmm. difficulty in life extreme po uh, trauma and poverty and addiction and broken relationships and all that. So my wife for a while had been coming to this side, this near east side of Indianapolis and I was sort of trailing along and getting okay. a taste for the neighborhood as she was doing her work and then, then the Lord began to lead me in this direction as well but also our church College Park Church on the north side of Indianapolis had some fingers in this area as well through some ministry efforts to children in this yeah. area. So um, our church 
really uh, stood up and in a really big way provided a partnership sort of relationship to us as we were doing these mm-hmm. ministries. Both, in, most importantly, I'd say, in terms of there was financial partnering in big ways with us, and not just once, but over time, mm-hmm. a lot of continual financial support because they wanted to, as, a, as part of their outreach, their urban outreach to, to help make uh, help serve the folks in this part of town. But also in terms of uh, College Park Church is a large church and lots of people, and mm-hmm. it also became a pathway for a lot of people to find a, a way to serve, a place to volunteer, okay. and, and put to work their God-given capabilities and experiences. And one of the first times I read about Purposeful Design was in a Gospel Coalition article about mm-hmm. College Park's Brookside Initiative, which includes Purposeful Design. I mean, these are separate entities. Um, your, your wife's organization, Heart Change, also I believe the Oaks Academy, a school. Yes. And so hitting some of the key pillars of, of a neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And coming back to Purposeful Design, my understanding is that, I mean, you live in Brookside, and many of the individuals that are working here uh, will also uh, reside in Brookside. And, and you're beginning to see how people with purpose following Jesus can actually impact the zip code. And so I, I just love yeah. that example. We are, for sure. My wife and I used to live on the north side of Indianapolis in the Carmel area in a pretty comfortable pretty comfortable area. And we really liked it there, but the Lord began to put on our hearts the desire, actually, to move and to live closer to the folks that we're serving. So we, about six years ago, moved into the near east side of Indianapolis. And we live about six blocks from where Purposeful Design is headquartered here. I can walk or bike to work if I oh, choose. Well, maybe not this morning. Yeah, a little chilly this <laughs> morning. But, but um, so, and we, we absolutely love living here. Some people have looked at that and thought, wow, what a sacrifice you made. How, how painful was that? And for us, it was pure joy every step of the way. Okay. It wasn't, um, for us, it was not a sacrifice. We actually enjoy life. We, in a lot of ways, we downsized. In almost every way, we downsized. Our lives mm-hmm. shrunk. Our, size of our house, the size of our yard, that everything shrunk. Um, but actually, our lives got much bigger when we moved here. Mm. Relationally, um, all kinds of blessings and bigness, and uh, we're close to our neighbors, we love our neighbors. And I think there's, a, there's something about people that are, are hurting, at least sometimes, people that are hurting, their pain is a little bit more on the surface and not hidden away behind all kinds of material coverings Mm -hmm. and it's uh, the pain points are more obvious and more exposed and people are more willing to 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 want to deal with their pain so not Mm -hmm. only do we have the blessing of serving here at purposeful design but we have rich relationships in our with our neighbors as well and 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 that's a, a beautiful testimony i think of the gospel and what what we can be doing um, even just in where we live and how we minister. So that's beautiful. You know, back to uh, purposeful design, I'd be interested uh, in just kind of the, the process. Right? So an individual may be coming out of jail or a Wheeler mission. Um, they come over, they get hired at purposeful design. What are some of the steps that you're intentionally taking them through um, to help them learn a skill, but then also uh, life skills? So uh, just a little bit about kind of the process that you walk them in through. Mm-hmm. So. Well, to begin with, that process starts. We've partnered with a lot of relief agencies in Indianapolis, such as Wheeler Mission, Good News Ministry, mm-hmm. Shepherd Community, okay. Outreach, who serves homeless teens, lots of different organizations that are serving the kind of folks that we want to serve. So, for example, Wheeler Mission, which we think is an outstanding organization in terms of helping change lives, when they are have, have worked with a man and he's gotten some stability in his life and he's found some distance between him and his addiction. It may be time for him to step out and try work and Mm -hmm. try uh, returning or going to what we might consider more normal way of living. So we partner with organizations like that and they send us um, folks that they think are ready for that next step, ready for work and responsibility and some discipline in their life. We take them and our first step here at Purposeful Design is an apprentice program. Mm -hmm. It's a fairly short two week program where we offer them, we pay them, uh, I think $14 an hour, and we pay them to be trained for a couple of weeks. And then also we're observing, of course, do they show up? Are they 
in a ready to learn position? And are they able to learn and are they able to acquire some skills? And if at the end of that apprentice program they can show that they can do the work that we need, that we do here, then we'll offer them a position. And our goal right now is to hire three, two or three new men a month out of this apprentice program. And uh, that's working really well. Our partners are fantastic, and it's a good way for us to find source people who are probably ready to work. At least it looks like they're ready to work. And then they step into, on the production floor, um, becoming, they've become a craftsman then. Mm -hmm. And we work four 10-hour days, 40 hours a week. And they need to show up on time and learn the skill and do what they're asked to do and get along well with everyone around and, and, pre and create beautiful furniture. Yeah. We've put into place what we call the Good Worker Program. We are actually trying to, what we're trying to do, we're trying to do a few things, but one of the things we're trying to do is create good workers out of people that are, have proven to not be good workers. So when we hire, we actually look for, you might call it the bottom of the barrel. We're not looking for the cream of the crop. Uh, in fact, one day I, we had just made a hire and I asked one of our production bosses, I said, so what do you think about the new guy? And he thought for a second, then he said, he's perfect. He's a former addict, and he has no skills. <laughs> so bullseye. Well, you, can teach, you can teach, dude. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, we, so the Good Worker Program is designed to create good workers. And that's really what, that's, that's what they need to become if they're going to become citizens who are contributing mm -hmm. something. Right? When we receive them, they, nobody wants to hire them. Mm. I... Normally, I wouldn't want to hire them. I don't think you'd want to hire them. Lily wouldn't want to hire them. Um, but what we, our goal is to make them hireable, make them desirable workers. And so we have this good worker program that has a variety of different things um, that are all aimed at helping teach responsibility and being a, being a good learner and um, being responsible and so forth and hopefully over time they become good workers and we're seeing that happen for sure in fact one of the beautiful things that has happened just recently is that about a year ago we had one craftsman who had been elevated to a supervisor position and that was it's hard it's hard we, we as hard as we try to, to make good workers it's hard it's hard to make them a good help them become a good worker it's even harder to help them raise up to mm. supervisor sort of talent so we had one, and we were really happy with that. But over the last year, we've there have been five others that have wow. proven themselves to be ready to be a supervisor, and uh, and there's a big leap there, and and we're finding that, and it's really beautiful. I'd love to see that. Well, I had the opportunity to be at at a, a session this morning, and just kind of watching this happen as they're talking about there's you know some interpersonal conflict, and then I, I think the floor is being moved around. And just watch as you're you're working through all of, you know all the things that happen in the workplace and and just training them. So it's just been so uh, interesting um, and, and really encouraging to me to just see this happen right here. Um, you're a humble person. I know those watching and listening may not have been able to meet you, but your results uh, to me are nothing short of incredible. And so I wanted to share a little bit about that. And one of the reasons I wanted to connect with Purposeful Design is that. Governor Holcomb has shared recidivism is a huge issue in the state. In fact, in his state of state address this year, he mentioned it again. And I know that he was here recently, I believe, um, visiting the, the premises, seeing what you're doing. Uh, but some of the stats, um, as far as I understand, is that recidivism, meaning someone that comes out of prison and then goes right back in, is generally at about 77%. But at Purposeful Design, it is at 8%. <laughs> so drug alcohol relapse is around 67 to 90%. At Purposeful Design, it is at about 17%. And then a return to homelessness is about 63%. And here it's at about 8%. And so my jaw just kind of <laughs> hit the floor. Um, and so you said you're bringing on um, three a month. How many individuals are you helping right now? And then how many have kind of gone through this program? We've had about 180 men here employed and trained since our founding. We have 20 full-time craftsmen right now. And so in, tw um, in 20, 
2020, we employed and trained 20 um, through the year, 20 mm -hmm. craftsmen. In 2021, our goal was to employ and train 30, and we ended up with 34. Awesome. Our goal this year is to employ and train 50 through the course of the year. Right. And we're at, we have 20 here right now. And with turnover and then growth, yeah. our goal is to get to 50. The average stay here is about 10 months. We don't, this is not a timed program where you come for 60 days or six months and then you're, you go on. We invite actually men here for a long walk for two reasons. One, because generally they need a long walk, like a 17 year, 17 year heroin addict comes here and he doesn't need a 60 day stay. Yeah, yeah. He, needs, he needs more time. And I so often hear from our craftsmen, say, they say things like, I'm just not ready yet to go back and stand on that same street corner. Mm. So they, so for the good of our craftsmen, we invite them in for a long walk. And then there's another reason why we like a long walk too, because we are competing every day in the marketplace mm. as we sell our furniture. On the, we compete on the basis of price and quality and service. So we need some talent on our team in order to keep our customers happy and buying companies like Anthem and Elanco and Ascension and many others. Yeah. So it helps us to have a talent pool here. And yes, we have some big growth goals and we, we only have those big growth goals. And actually our growth goal for right for this year is 50 men employed and trained in the year. Our, our eventual goal is to employ and train a hundred men per year here, here in Indianapolis. And the only reason that we have that goal is because we're seeing it work. Mm. The model is yeah. working. Yeah. It's been refined and we're seeing God's power released here yeah, and absolutely. he's changing lives. And because of that, we want to see, we want to help as many people as we can. So we want to step into this as long as God is showing his favor here. We want to run with it and help all we can. If you're comfortable sharing, I was also just um, blessed, astounded by your revenue goals, uh, the, the revenue targets you're hitting, um, and then kind of where, where you're taking it. And anybody that's in ministry knows it takes dollars uh, to do something like this. And it, I was just amazed to see the, the corporate investment and the fact that you have partners that are coming in saying, hey, we're going to buy most of our furniture. And so just to kind of give the listeners a, an idea of the scope of, of what you're doing mm -hmm. here, I think that'd be helpful to know. Yeah. Sure. Well, on the demand side, yeah. which I think is what you're talking about, the our customer side, we've had close to 600 different companies purchase from us. And that when I say companies, I'm including businesses, hospitals, schools, universities, um, airports, all different kinds of customers. But in the commercial marketplace. And then more recently, we have a lot, many of our customers are, in fact, I, probably all of our customers are, it's not just a, a, a financial transaction for them. Mm. Yeah. They're in it because they believe in the ministry. They've, most of them visit here and they see what's going on and they say, yeah, we, that's a no brainer. We want to be a part of that. So we were observing that many of our customers are really um, in with us in a big way. And so we started wondering, is there a way that we might um, create even deeper relationship with some of our customers, especially our, our larger ones, and through that, have them participate in bigger ways? So what we actually do is we sit at this table where you and I are, and we invite senior leadership from some of our big customer relationships to come and sit with us, and we ask them, because we're not for profit at, um, enterprise 501c3 we feel emboldened to make some big asks that we wouldn't if we were a for-profit organization and so we sit with senior executives and we say we're so grateful that you've put us in a vendor lane we're very grateful it's not easy to, to become a supplier of Lilly or Anthem mm -hmm. grateful for that and we ask them could you imagine with us the possibility of having purposeful design in a partner lane rather than only a vendor lane mm -hmm. and what how that might look different than than just a vendor. And so we had that conversation, we've had that conversation with 21 different organizations, some of the largest organizations in, in our city, uh, multiple billion dollar organizations. And with everyone we sat with and asked that, made that invitation, everyone has said, absolutely, that's a no brainer, we're glad you invited us to the table we're in. And then we talk about things like, well, what does that mean? How do we, how do we run that new play? What might that mm -hmm. look like? And so we, we've come to some solutions with them. So one of the things it means is that there is named at their organization a person that we call the Purposeful Design Advocate. Someone there to sort of wave the Purposeful Design flag periodically. 
and to keep it from falling from the front burner, which is, is at the time of our meeting, to yeah. keep it falling to a back burner because we're all busy and we're sure. used to running down certain yeah. lanes. So they name an advocate, and then we talk about what kind of, uh, in fact, one of our partners said to us, hey, we love this idea, but to be honest with you, if we don't set some goals, nothing's going to happen. So we learned from them, our partner, that we need to set some goals, help them set some goals so that something happens. Because they're saying we want to fight poverty by throwing our corporate weight into the purposeful mm-hmm. design fight. But what will that look like? Well, it's so encouraging. And again, just the scope of this was just amazing. I was, I was looking through the partners. And I know that you have you know some plan, perhaps a, a goal, dream of expanding uh, beyond just Indianapolis, but maybe moving into other parts of the country. And there might be listeners that'd be interested in that. And so uh, if you're at liberty to share, what kind of expansion plans do you have? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, consistent with the theme of we want to help all the people we can, yeah, if God's absolutely. at work here, yeah. then let's let's make much of it. It's sort of yeah. like with the when God gave the talents to yeah. in this little story, um, that can be multiplied. 30, 60, 100 fold with, yeah. in the case of the soils or you can bury it in the sand. And we just want to not, we just want to be, not be those that are burying it when God is at work, but um, meet him there where he's at work and, and um, run hopefully in a um, obedient fashion into what he's making possible. So part of that is that we have a growth vision of replicating purposeful design in 10 cities around the country. Yeah. And we're just right now in the stage of praying toward that and building relationship and doing exploratory work. And then hopefully that'll happen before too long. And one of the fun things has been that really since our founding, we've had a variety of individuals and churches and organizations come to us and say, hey, we like what's going on there. Would you think about doing that also in our city? Mm-hmm. We've had a number of those, probably 10 or 15 um, inquiries over the years and we haven't been ready to do it but sure. what's happened more recently which has been fun to see is that some of our large corporate partners have said hey we're not only big here in Indianapolis we also are big in Raleigh Durham uh, or we have sense. a major um, facility in St. Louis and there are folks there too that are in the same kind of plight that mm. as that the Indianapolis folks are and so some of them have said why don't you think about replicating purposeful design in that city and we could be a corporate anchor for you there and a corporate partner. Well, I'm so grateful for your your personal example, but then you using the skills, the business skills that God gave you uh, to build this remarkable ministry. And I often think about how can we be more strategic? How can we create a significant difference in a problem that the state and our society can't solve? And when people say, how'd you do that? We can say, well, Christ, you know, yes. and that's Absolutely. that's the goal. And so I'm just grateful for your your example of that. And if there's anything else that you'd like to share about purposeful design, uh, any encouragement you might have uh, for the listeners? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I I'm loving the practice of when I run into something bigger than me, mm-hmm. ask God about it. And wow. I've done that a number of times in my life, and it's um, every single time it's led to something that wow, I would have never imagined that. I just, mm. I didn't have, my, my brain wasn't populated with that kind of thinking or that kind of solution. And God has consistently answered that prayer in really fun and fruitful ways. Yeah, I think mean, buckle up. That's right. <laughs> if you ask it though, That's you, right. you may be starting a, a major <laughs> organization and moving uh, your family and yeah. everything. Well, wow. what a remarkable example. Um, so if you had a, a billboard on which you could put a message to church leaders and other committed Christians, what would you put on it? I think I would put simply stick tight to Jesus. Mm-hmm. I'm learning that as Jesus describes in the Gospel of John, the, the concept of abiding in Christ or remaining mm-hmm. in Christ. I try and mm-hmm. think, what does that mean? What does that, re- what does that mean to abide in Christ? And my best articulation of it is to stick tight to Jesus. Mm-hmm. And I'm finding that that's the only good place to be it's the only safe place to be it's the only profitable place to be and i don't i'm not speaking financially but um, Mm. how do we live productive fruitful lives that's the place to be and here at purposeful design our hope is that we see lives change one of the things i've learned is that i have no ability to change a life i uh, can't change my own life very well i can't change my wife's life very well and i certainly can't change these men's lives but the power of god is explosive in positive ways, mm. 
and he can change lives. So, and that's what he's primarily given us to do, to be ambassadors of his and to be a part of his great mission to reconcile the world to himself, and we get to be a part of that. So I'm thinking the best place to be for that is to stick tight to Jesus. Amen. Amen to that. I do encourage listeners, uh, go to uh, the Purposeful Design website. It'll be linked in the show notes. And if you are a business leader, consider perhaps some furniture needs. And I I will tell you, high-quality stuff, uh, very beautiful. And so, David, I'm thank you for, thankful, thankful for you taking some time today uh, to share the story of, of this ministry. Um, and how can we be praying for you in the coming months? Mm, I'd love prayers for wisdom. Okay. Wisdom. I find that God's wisdom helps on, uh, covers kind of the whole waterfront of challenges in life. So that would be wonderful. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'll pray, pray for you as we end. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you uh, for for David and his family, uh, for the vision of purposeful design. I think of just this beautiful goal of helping corporate America throw its weight into fighting poverty, but most importantly, assisting those that have wrestled with an addiction to find purpose through through work, but also purpose uh, through Christ, as we've talked about today. I pray for David for for wisdom as he's asked today, and with the expansion plans that they have, ex- expanding the number of men that they're serving here, as well as around the country, may you just give him wisdom as he navigates that favor with uh, some of these corporate partners and then the resources to make this dream a reality. And we just thank you for his example, for your love for us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.